dear brothers and respected elders, you, you know, do you remember last week I was talking to you about uh, some issues of in regards to finances, and I mentioned to you an incident of a brother. Okay, a bill came to him, and then he said, I have to pay the bill because the bill came in my name. So I thought, if some of you remember, TK, if you don't, that's not a problem. I want to talk about this actually today, about how our, so our dealings amongst each other, financial dealings specifically, okay? And how unfortunately, if we don't be careful, we can often find ourselves making mistakes, blunders, errors, and earning the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they call, what is it? Is that first of all, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala mentions in the glorious Quran, okay? He mentions in the Quran, Kareem, verse 29 in Surah An-Nisa. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bilbatil, illa an takuna tijaratan an taradhi minkum. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he's ordering the believers that don't consume the wealth, your, each other's wealth, in an in 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 unjust and an incorrect way. Zulum ke saad, mal na harab karo, karo. Don't eat the wealth of each other unjustly. Illa an takuna tijaratan an taradim minkum. How you're supposed to earn money is how? Through business and tijara an taradim minkum. Kibay, mutually. Where everyone is happily mutually. So in essence, Allah is saying, don't do zulm, do business. In essence, do the right thing, not the wrong thing. Now, you see what it is, is that one of the things is because obviously you, a lot of the brothers here, Alhamdulillah, you're involved in businesses and shops and so on. Remember one thing, deen, to learn deen is fard on every individual. But you wouldn't need to learn, say for example, the fards of agriculture because you're not in agriculture. You wouldn't, for example, have to do the learning of business because perhaps you work for somebody. You don't have to do, for example, the, 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 the fiqh, excuse me, of being a leader because you're not a leader. So what I'm trying to say is because the Islam, the shu'ba and the branch of Islam, the branches of Islam are so vast, you have to learn that thing which is related to you. So in your 24 hour life, whatever you come across, that's what you have to learn. So you have a business, for example, okay? So now it's follows on you to learn the usul, the etiquettes, the manner and the usul of business. Someone's involved in agriculture, not business. He or she must understand and learn what are the usul, the rules, the, 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 the ahkam in, and the usul in relation to agriculture. Because there is an usher and so on, there are some rules. And likewise, whatever you're involved in, you have to learn the things in relation, relation to that. Ulama generally learn across the board. They learn different fields, different things. They have an understanding of a lot of different things. Okay? But it's not a requirement for everyone to become an alim, not for everyone to become a scholar. Ha, but what you're involved in, by usko to karna padega. That you have to learn. Okay? So, what I want to say is, now where do we get this whole concept from anyway? In actual fact, amr bil ma'roof and nahiyan al munkar is actually a part, from, part of this. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Under this verse, Amr bil ma'roof nahin al munkar is not simply only just inviting towards good and forbidding evil verbally. There are other ways how to do it. Umar radiallahu anhu and his zamana, how he actually made this become more in existence was he made governors or certain individuals responsible and overseeing the marketplaces. What he used to do, he used to put key people, that your, your zimidari is this, you've got to oversee the marketplaces. Suleiman bin Hathama, As-Sa'ib bin Yazid, Abdullah bin Utba bin Mas'ud, these are three names which, come, which are very, very commonly mentioned as these were the main people that would overlook the bazaars. As-Sa'ib bin Yazid particularly, he was the supervisor, the overseer of the marketplace and the bazaar of Medina. Asa'ib bin Yazid. And then in addition to that, you have what's it, Suleiman bin Hathama, the first person who I mentioned. He was like the overall. So you could say he was like the, the minister of finance or the minister of commerce or something along these lines. He was in charge of those, that person that would oversee all the activities in the marketplaces. The Hisbah. In Arabic, we refer to it as the Hisbah. Okay? In Islamic finance, Hisbah as well. What does that mean? It means that your business should run ethically. There should be those things which are what? Halal in nature, in trade, there'll be halal to trade. Things that don't destroy wealth, that don't destroy nasal progeny, that don't destroy people's intellect. So all these things are part of Islamic intervention to ensure that the goods that are going out are decent, spot on and perfect. Okay, Why are, it's good to mention this while I've got it in the mind, right? Is that this whole notion, when we say the word Sharia law, if I were to ask an average Joe, not Muslim, non-Muslim, 
even average Joe Muslim as well, if I were to say, just tell me what is the first word, when I say to you, Sharia law, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And I think about it for a second. If I say Sharia, generally, does anyone want to share what they thought of? Honestly. Honestly. Be, be free, inshallah. If you don't want to say, then that's okay. That, that's actually a better answer. I actually asked this same question because I said this, I said this sentence before, a little while ago, in somewhere else in London. Someone said to him, what first thing comes to my mind is chopping off hands. Because that's, that's what they're thinking is, sharia, sharia law. Sharia law is flogging people, cutting off hands. That is a, subhanAllah, that's actually hudud. In Islam, we refer to that as the hudud ordinance, which is a very slim, thin branch of the overall bigger, wider sharia. Okay? The fact that you guys have got here to pray, that's part of the sharia. I, for example, now provide for my family, that is a part of the Sharia. Me even obeying the laws of the land that don't go against my deen, that is also part of the Sharia as well. Okay, so this whole notion of Sharia law, Sharia law, as if Muslims are about to, you know, start cutting open hands in public, this is an absolute, I mean, it's absolute nonsense that people even think like this. But the Sharia covers five things, okay? Hifadatul deen. Preservation, protection of being. Preservation and protection of nafs, meaning life. Preservation and protection of aql and intellect. Preservation and protection of progeny. And last but not least, preservation and protection of mal and money. Okay, so we have here five things. We have uh, deen, we have deen, nafs, uh, intellect, progeny, and also money. Okay. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu made a governor responsible, a supervisor to oversee all the marketplaces, that's hifadatul mal. That is implementing that part of the sharia which is in relation to wealth. Let's open that up. That means all our transactions should be permissible. Nothing, 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 for example, what I mean impermissible. So if somebody wants to sell arms, they want to sell arms, firearms, it'd be impermissible. You could not make it accessible to every Tom, Dick and Harry in the public. Why? Because this could be used to destroy what? Mal. It could be destroy, used to destroy nafs, life, and so on. So it'd be impermissible. There would be a regulation on certain things that can be sold. Like for example, if you wanted to just sell certain random chemicals, you can't. Why? Because that can protect, uh, it can harm people's mal, it can protect, harm people's nafs, it can harm people's progenies. It wouldn't become permissible. So like for example, recently, this I'll tell you about personally about myself, is uh, a couple of years ago I did, a, I did a course which is on hijama. Okay, so I'm a certified hijama therapist. So I was trying to set up a practice. So I tried to get registered. But the council obviously they gave me a long list of things. I've got to have this registration and, uh, and, and, and waste disposal and so on. And subhanAllah, I was... Yes, it's a pain in the neck because I have to go through the whole process. But the second time, alhamdulillah, this is Islamic purely. Because they said if you were to take blood and tip it down the drain, that can infect people, it can hurt people. Hifadatul nafs, that is exactly what the Sharia wants. So when people say Sharia law, Muslim, you're, there is, I swear by Allah, honestly, there is sometimes more Sharia here than there is even in a lot of Muslim countries. We seem to think Sharia is just masjid, namaz, that's Sharia. Masjid bought them, mashallah. Plenty of masajid, plenty of rose. But that's one aspect, that's just the ibadah. What about the mu'amalat, the mu'ashara, akhlaq? What about that part of the sharia? That's why we say, that's why so much barakah is coming. Because I see that the people are implementing proper Islam. It's just minus the iman billah and iman in Rasul, iman in qiyamah, iman in jannah and jahannam. But you can see your dealings, I'll tell you. You can see your dealings, you can see your dealings. You can and they recognize people, understanding people, tolerant people. Unfortunately, you know, my brother, he had to close, one of his, he went bankrupt in one business because one Muslim stung him. I own Muslim brother, and he goes, brother, brother, he was referring to him as brother. He didn't know that his brother will do something, he'll cause his business to shut down. Because my brother, my brother fell for the brother. Anyway, Allah khayyar banda barabar nahi hai, not everyone is the same, astaghfirullah. We're not trying to paint everyone with the same brush. Achei log bhi hai, mashallah. But I'm saying that when we seem to think of Islam, we limit it just to masjid. So if we see a masjid in an area, we see mashallah Muslims praying, we say alhamdulillah, sharia to take, this is, Islam is alive or because there's a masjid in the area. How about the dealings of the people and so on? So this is why this, these social dealings, right, financial dealings are also a part of Islam. And that's what the Sharia comes to protect and to make sure that it, it keeps safe for the people. 
So Dean, money, so on and so forth, okay? One of the things now which I wanted to mention is that even now, for example, building a hospital, if we say to people, give money, fi sabilillah, the first thing that comes to my mind, fi sabilillah, I should go to a masjid and deposit the money into a masjid account. I should perhaps maybe possibly give the money to a madrasa, maybe a certain orphanage, for example. But a hospital, take a hospital, for example. A hospital protects, safeguards, makes hifada of people's nafs, their life, their progeny. So if you were to help a hospital financially, that is also part of the key maqasid and purpose and, and ideals of the sharia. But you understand what I'm saying? But Islam is not this narrow definition. Namaz padli, alhamdulillah, yeh bashariyat aagi yathari. That's a very, very slim portion. We're not knocking it. Mashallah, namaz is very important. And there is that other extreme as well. There's one doctor, he never used to pray namaz. And what he would do is he would go home at night time, he would pray Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, all in one. He goes, I'm doing a khidmat. There's no space for your aql here. Allah said, pray salah, you pray salah. That's it. You don't say, well, I think because I'm doing khidmat of people. Well, then if you take that rationale, where on earth is it ever going to stop? So that's why we, we don't fit our own understanding of deen in. Deen is what it is, okay? But for us to narrow deen, that's not right. That's what I'm trying to say. So anyway, as I said, protection of, of intellect and so on, that's all part of the sharia. Now, what, what one thing we don't understand is that when we consume najai's wealth, when we do something, okay, because generally the notion is that haram, if I say to you, uh, earn, you know, riba insurance or, or zulum or drugs all these things people say that's haram chori pasa theft money dealing in black market goods this is impermissible so we think generally think of that as haram but what about the other side of things that which we don't even generally our minds don't generally go towards alhamdulillah our communities are still mashallah they're doing their part but there are some people who don't regard for example telling the odd blag to earn money as anything wrong Fraud, for example, selling a car, saying, brother, it's a good car, mashallah, it's perfect. Look, alhamdulillah, all good. And he knows himself that he's doing wrong. He knows himself that the car is not what he makes out to be. By Allah, every cent, every basa, every pound, every rupee, every dollar is haram that you just earned from that money. Take another example. Someone, for example, he says, um, he, like they know, there's another thing, not even says, he does rather a, uh, a claim, insurance claim. They jambuchke, two people they say, bruv, I'm gonna drive my car into you and then you're gonna complain of whiplash and then we'll go 50-50. That's a bodo there. So much. Allah mafama, you go to some places up north, it's really common. One giza, Allah and it saddens me. Look at, let me tell you, this happens amongst everybody. English, Muslim, I mean Pakistani, Asian, Bengali, in African, Indian, all relate all nations. Uh, why I have a problem is if anyone who says La ilaha illallah, they do it, that's when I'm upset. It's because you knew you wasn't supposed to do that. And we believe in the Akhirah, so a Muslim should have an extra thing to say, no, I shouldn't do that. Because our Yaqeen is not, no one is Raziq. Allah is Raziq. He's Razak, He provides. So why me do something wrong to displease Allah when it's Allah who's going to provide anyway? So if somebody, for example, does business and be honest and say, brother, look, I've got this phone. Uh, this, this phone is worth... 350 pounds approximately it's normal market price is 400 but you know i dropped it and there's a little chip can you just see that little mark there and that's why market value is this there'd be so much baraka in that rather than you say like you hold the phone in such a way and say here the here, look at the phone you're trying to conceal the faults don't say nothing keep it quiet okay you earn an extra 50 quid as we say in urdu you made a fool out of someone okay you fooled somebody you earn an extra 50 quid. How long is that money going to last? <coughs> a day, two days, five days, a week? Then what? There's zero barakah in that money because you just told the, you spoke a lie. Our mind, the general white, we call them white lies. These are absolute, it's not the shan of a Muslim, <coughs> Allahu Akbar. Like for example, another one. Some, uh, okay, let's look at it from another angle. People pretending that they're ill to claim disability living allowance. I've got a back problem, I've got a leg problem. Or the worst one, I, I, and I know this happens as well, against all cultures, but they call, it happens in everyone. But like I said, I've got an issue and it's my right to educate the Muslims about this. Get, understand that, don't think because I'm, it's the government that you're going to get away with it. No, that's najaiz. Incorrect but earning benefits. It's haram. It's not, but I, 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 don't, I don't know any other fatwa. I don't look at that as permissible. Now, people can take my opinion or not, that's your business. 
I've got a duty to speak what I think is the haqq and I honestly feel it because we are here in Darul Aman, no one is attacking us, the little we can do, if people are being so generous and kind to us, the little we can do, at least don't do fraud to get money back. That's what I advocate. So some people pretend, oh, I've got a problem, okay, then go off on DLA. Now they pay your housing benefit. There's a rule that you're not supposed to leave the country for four weeks. People go sit in, mashallah, abroad for two to three months at a time. That's wrong. I don't, I, I think this is haram. Wallah, I qasam, I don't see any other opinion. Because I'm looking at that, you've, you've told a deliberate lie, you've blagged, and you've got something which you weren't in receipt of. And then now you go and misuse that system. Like I said, does everyone do this, right? But I've got a problem if a Muslim does it. Because we should be those individuals that people see our mu'amalat and say, Subhanallah, that guy is so trustworthy that he speaks the truth that even he told us, I'm going on holiday from this time to this time. What, what, who is this person? What is he? Oh, he's a Muslim. Ah, okay, that's Muslim. Now, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, he went abroad. There was a delegation of ulama that went from Karachi area. And he saw something and he was so inspired. He goes, that I was close to cry because of what I saw. Some people, you know, they jump on like a metro, a train and so on. You have to buy a ticket. Okay, sometimes a conductor comes, sometimes he doesn't. But anyway, what happened was the guy was rushing, rushing, rushing. He got on and he got onto the platform. And then what the Molana saw is that when they were leaving, there were some people that bought a couple of tickets and they tore them. But you have you jump on the guy for the, for the vehicle and then you get off, you purchase a ticket and tear the ticket. So Mohana was a bit shocked. He, this happened in Germany. So he said, I was a, like, that seems a bit stupid. Like you bought a ticket and tore it. And then someone said, no, there's no soul. Obviously you've ridden the bus, the tram, the, the, whatever the conveyance was. It costs one or two euros. You didn't pay that because you were rushing. You could have got it on board because you thought you was going to see the conductor and say, sorry, I didn't have it, but I'm a regular. I'll pay for it on board. And they know you. You didn't see the conductor. So he got off, bought a ticket, tore a ticket. That's the huck of the government. I, I took a free ride. Now that's a person who doesn't believe in La ilaha illallah, who doesn't believe in Muhammad Rasulullah, maybe possibly doesn't have no yaqeen of the akhirah, but yet are they displaying, is that Islamic akhlaq? Ye Islam and Abaisab? That is Islam. That is exactly what Islam is. Okay, he hasn't got a beard and doesn't wear a jubba, hasn't got a hat and doesn't, you know, mashallah, he's praying five times salah, but he's akhlaq, he's mu'amalat, he's, that's Islam. That's exactly what we're trying to bring. That's what we're trying to encourage by these bayanat or these khutbat or these nasiha, whatever you want to refer to it, is to bring these key qualities within ourselves. Analyze ourselves and say, okay, namaz shahs we do, alhamdulillah, rose coming, we'll all fast. Zakat, mashallah, we give. Haji sahab, there are plenty of haji sitting here. But look at our mu'amalat, look at our social dealings, look at our interaction, our financial transactions. This is where it really lies because finance and wealth, everyone wants wealth. You don't want to be hit in the pocket. To give away money, to not take something you're not entitled to is a hard thing to do. I'm going to finish off in a couple of minutes. I just want to finish one hadith quickly. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu mentioned this hadith in Sahih Muslim, okay? So if you want to check it out, it's 1015. inshallah. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, there's a hadith, he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed the Sahaba and he said, Inna Allah tayyib, la yaqbalu illa tayyiban. Allah is pure and he doesn't accept anything but purity, but pure things. And he mentions Allah ordered the believers the same thing what he ordered the Anbiya. Allah ordered the believers, you and I, okay, you have to do that thing, what he ordered the Anbiya. What did he order the Anbiya? Number one. Number two, This is all the same hadith. He said, number one, eat pure things, pure. Not tainted with filth, not tainted with fraud, not tainted with lies. It's funny, subhanAllah, some people, haram money, busing true religion gene three, four hundred pounds, and coming to pray Jummah in their haram clothes. Baisab, you got to think logically, subhanAllah, you just purchase, what are you wearing head to toe? Those earnings, are they even halal or not? Anyway, Eat pure and then do good deeds. The scholars of Tasir mention, you know it comes after Tayyibat, Wa'amalu Saliha, do good deeds. Why? Because your, your Tayyib food, your halal earnings that you eat will have a direct asr and effect on your ibadah. If you eat pure, you will be given tawfiq to do good deeds. But how many people complain? I'm so depressed. I, just, I don't know what's wrong. I just feel this and stress. Okay, there are a number of reasons. This is also one of the reasons. If the income we're eating is mashkuk, doubtful, and at times haram, what tawfiq, what, what sukun are you going to get? 
What's the, it would have been better to pay our taxes, don't do fraud, don't claim Najai's benefits, but at least, alhamdulillah, Torah ko, saaf ko. Eat little but eat pure, alhamdulillah, at least then mashallah we will have a better life. But the second thing, Allah is saying what we gave to you, eat from that. Rasulullah says something, gave an example. He mentioned an individual and then he said there's one particular person, Thumma Dhakar Rajul, Yutilu Safar. He's on a long journey, Ash'ath, Aghbar. He's disheveled, he's dirty, meaning he's head to toe covered in dust. And he raised his hand and he says, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Oh my Allah, Oh my Allah. He's shouting out to Allah in dua, beseeching Allah in dua. Rasulullah sallallahu said, Iski Zahri hard, look at his condition. Generally, there are those individuals that when they swear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah accepts their du'as. This individual, he's disheveled, he's looking as we refer to as mashup. What happens? Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb, mat'amahu haram, mashrabahu haram, malbasahu haram, wa ghudhiya bil haram, anna yustajabu, fa anna yustajabu li thalik. Like in this bandika kya hai? He doesn't eat halal, he's, he's clothing. He's, he's eating is haram, he's drinking is haram, his libas is haram, and he's fed with haram. Where and ever is this person's dua ever going to be accepted in the court of Allah? So my dear brothers, they call, a lot can be said because I said I'm going to stop at 25 too. So let's stop here inshallah. Bottom line is, we need to obviously start analyzing our lives and not just look at it as ibadah in the masjid, but other aspects as well. I will talk about this another week, but one of the biggest zulms we do, another haram, we make mahroom our children from their miras, Allahu Akbar. Fathers won't give their daughters inheritance. They'll say, when I did their shadi, I had to give five dollar sona, so I'm not giving her any money. La ilaha illallah. Bay, who told you to give that much then? Give within your means and make her an inheritor of your money. Oh, this son I'm going to give more because he helped me in the business. But the other son, I'm not giving him nothing. You haven't got that choice. You're going to have to give equally to all your children. Oh, one son lived with me, so because of that, I'm giving him more. But you are not Allah. Allah already set the standards. So this is another bayan, inshallah, and we'll touch on this. Allah give us tawfiq.